All right. Um, so today we're starting day one. You guys have, like I've already said, uh, <laughs> you guys have survived kinesiology. Uh, <laughs> you know, that, that very, very technical class. Um, but now we're, we're moving into, this is going to be PFT 106. I know that's a little weird, by the way. Like we went from PFT 119 to PFT 106. After that, we're going to go to PFT 120. There's no rhyme or reason to how these numbers work. Uh, <laughs> um, but uh, so don't even worry about that. But it's, this is going to be 106, right? So this is uh, uh, special populations, what I call it. I think the official full title is like special populations exercise prescription, maybe. Um, but I usually just call it special pops. Uh, and that's, that's really what we're kind of going over. We're just looking at, um, you know, a lot of our exceptions to, to how we do things, right? So, uh, you know, the classic example is like, oh, if you've got a client who's, you know, uh, doing this, what you want to do is this, right? Like, you know, they're, they're in whatever phase of training you want to do, you know, 85 to hundred percent of their one rep max. And you want to do it for, um, you know, one to five reps. That's great. As long as like, they can sort of handle that. Right. Uh, this is going to be, um, you know, this is, uh, uh, this class is all about like, well, if they have like a specific condition, 85 to hundred percent of their one rep max is probably not very appropriate. You know, um, if they have like osteoporosis, for instance, we like heavy lifting, um, because that can be really good for bone density, but up as high as that is a little bit inappropriate. That's a little bit, you know, too much, um, close to their one rep max, because like, you know, they're probably going to have bone density issues and that might actually even cause like fractures lifting that heavy. So we don't want to do that kind of thing, right? So how do we know like which populations we want to like modify for and, you know, what are the modifications we want to make? Well, that's what this class is all about. So if we look at like youth and senior populations, for instance, right? Like youths, they're really bad at like heavy, heavy, heavy lifting. And so like we want to make sure that we, we lift kind of moderately. Seniors, uh, actually somewhat kind of similar, um, but they can handle a little bit more. But both of these populations actually are somewhat similar in that we focus a little bit more on endurance rather than focusing on strength. What's youth uh, though? Like what's the, like youth, where does it end? Uh, well, that kind of depends. I mean, like technically any youth yeah. is considered like age two, which we don't ever deal oh. with. Oh. Um, <laughs> yeah. Until when? Yeah. Yeah, anywhere from two to 18. Um, right. But usually most gyms, like, you know, kids will start uh, coming in there around like age 14 is usually like the minimum age for most most gym memberships, yeah. um, just for insurance purposes and stuff. So you'll be working okay. somewhere in there. But if you end up working with like, you know, say you want to work with like kids, right? Um, and do like after school fitness and things like that, like, <laughs> outdoor, like sports, um, yeah. you'll probably end up doing just like a lot of like, you know, playing like soccer games or variations and, sport, you know, uh, yeah, exercise games, uh, yeah. and that's all very much endurance based. You know, it's a lot of cardio. Um, yeah, you don't want to hand them no thirty pound weights. Exactly, and here's the thing: like we actually know, like you can lift weights as a little kid, as a you know, as a teenager. Like all that's actually fine. You don't have to worry about it stunting your growth or anything like that. That's a total myth. Yeah. Um, but they don't have the focus for it, you know? So if you yeah. are going to lift weights, yeah, you should absolutely do like lightweight for a high number of repetitions, because that's something that like, you know, by doing lightweight, they're not really at any risk of hurting themselves when they inevitably as children start screwing around, you know, <laughs> <laughs> some, sometimes it's not even about physiology. Sometimes it's about, you know, just sort of how a population acts, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, that's just, <laughs> like, that's true of our pregnancy clients as well. Right. Like here's, what's kind of funny. You'll notice we put obesity, diabetes, and pregnancy on one day. Um, no, this is not similar to these things, but the modifications that you make are somewhat similar, uh, like obese clients, for instance, one of the things you want to be aware of is the, like maybe getting down on the floor and getting back up on their feet is just challenging, you know? Um, maybe like, that's just a really difficult thing for them to do that impact on their knees and their joints and things can make them feel really uncomfortable. So we got to be cautious of that. Right. Um, if a client has diabetes, you want to make sure they're fueled up before exercise, you know, um, so they don't like pass out in the middle of a workout. Uh, and if a client is like pregnant, you got to make sure you don't lay them down or, you know, face down or face up because it's going to be uncomfortable. 
Yeah. Uh, and then always be aware of they, they overheat really quickly. You know, they get really uncomfortable and cranky. Um, so you just got to watch out for that. So, you know, that's, that's sort of what this class is going to be. So we're going to look at like a lot of these different conditions um, and sort of how to make modifications. And then the big thing they'll want you to know that's like test worthy, um, you know, if you're prepping for your test. And by the way, this makes up a very, very, very small section of your test. You know, if we're looking at like, you know, this is chapter, I want to say 17, no, chapter 20 in your textbook. Um, if you look, right, is that right? Ah, whatever. It's, it's somewhere between 17 and 20. Um, I'm really bad at knowing the chapters, but uh, if we look, if we look at the NASA exam blueprint here, you'll notice the, the special population stuff. It's actually going to fall somewhere between like program design and exercise technique. So like those are very large sections, but if you go down to it, you'll notice, uh, let's see here, where do they keep it? Um, uh, yeah, so literally it's one, two, it's like two of the specific domains out of like all of the domains throughout the entire freaking book, you know? So it's a very, very, very small section of your test, but you know, it's, they all start to add up. So we got to make sure we cover it. So, plus you want to know how to work with these people because um, let me tell you, I was always known as like the special populations guy at my gym, um, which was great. Like I was the corrective exercise guy and the, the special population, anybody with like an injury, you know, osteoporosis, arthritis, low back pain, knee pain, shoulder pain, things like that. Um, I sort of carved out like a niche at my gym. So anytime somebody walked into the, to the door with that, if my manager or one of the salespeople or the front desk or anybody like, you know, starts talking to this person and like chit chatting and they're like, why are you here? And they're like, oh, well, you know, I, I've got this arthritis pain. And so my doctor told me I should start exercising and it might help. Uh, and they hear that arthritis thing, they're going to, my, you know, my face is going to pop into their brain. Uh, yeah. And that's, that's great. That helps my wallet a lot. Um, yeah. So, you know, that's where we, we kind of want to get you guys at. Get you guys to, I guess, how English works. So, uh, <laughs> so let's take a look at this uh, schedule here. Um, so today we're going over the special populations and exercise prescription. This is going to be our intro day. Um, it's going to be a pretty gentle lesson, uh, which is nice. Uh, if anybody hasn't finished their final from the last class, you'll. Yeah. Um, actually, I have a question. Um, yeah, please. The due date for that final, is it, it's not due today, is it? Not necessarily. Um, okay. <laughs> my advice would be get it done before Monday, because we are going to get yeah. another piece of homework tomorrow. Tomorrow, um, yeah. So the homework never slows down, right? Yeah. Uh, so, you know, my advice is if you can get it done today, great, you should do it. Uh, yeah. But if you okay. wanna like take the weekend and get, you know, homework one of this class done as well as like the final done so that you're not behind next week, that's okay. also pretty acceptable. And then the notes that you gave us last night, um, mm -hmm. the ones that you printed out, mm -hmm. those are good to study for the homework, right? Or yeah, for the uh, final, the, for the last thing. class, yeah. I mean, like yeah. I said, like, this okay. class a little bit different, but yeah. What would okay, you consider you. like, um, sorry, what would you consider like uh, good grade as in like, let's say out of 30 questions, like how many oh. wrongs? Uh, I mean. I'm this kind of person where it's like, if I get like more than three, I'm, I'm, I'm effed. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if you get, uh, you know, if you're missing three out of 30, um, you that's know, good, dude. That's you not know, bad that's at all. Really decent, you know. <laughs> like, oh, okay, okay. Yeah. Well, no, it wasn't this one. It was like the first one that we did. The first thirty questions. I think it was last week, right? Yeah, the midterm. Yeah, the midterm. Yeah, yeah. Uh, this one was twenty nine out of thirty, so it wasn't bad. I felt a little better. Great, dude. Yeah, you should sell yeah. that. I took an hour and 20 minutes. Like, I literally like was like, <laughs> bro, I got to get this shit done. Like, it has to make sense. Like, I have to go through the notes and everything and the flashcards. Right. I was like, okay, it makes sense. But then there was one where, like, it sounded so similar, but yeah. it wasn't really that. And I was like, ah, oh, yeah. I went back to that answer. Like, uh, oh. One word. One word. Yeah. yeah. That's the thing. And, it, and, it, and when you see that kind of stuff, it, it feels like a trick question. But it's like, I, I always tell people this, you know um i they can't they're not allowed to do trick questions they don't do trick questions the, the closest to a trick question and you guys uh mir and, and eddie you won't necessarily 
a hundred percent know like what I'm going to reference right here because we haven't gone through our first program design class yet. Yeah. But give you a brief rundown so I can fill you in a little. And then Thomas, this is going to be a question for you. And I'll warn you, it'll feel like a trick question. Uh, <laughs> is um, so when it comes to picking core exercises, guys, we're gonna teach you that there's different phases and different levels of training. Um, and then that with those levels of training, there's different versions of core exercises, right? So NASM's got what's called the OPT model. It's this whole staircase right here. And you're gonna, basically you are splitting up your clients into five different types, one, two, three, four, five. Um, and then within those five types, like this, these three here actually are falling into the same level. So these three levels here indicate which type of exercise you're gonna pick. And so like you've got basically core exercises that don't move the spine, core exercises that do move the spine and core exercises that move the spine really fast. So that is core stabilization, core strength and core power, okay? So just to fill you in as I ask this trick question. So if I were to say, and Thomas, this is for you, uh, this will, like I said, feel this is as close to a trick question as NASA will ever do. If you have a client in the stabilization level, which of the following core exercises is most appropriate? A medicine ball overhead throw, a uh, hanging leg raise, a stability ball crunch, or a plank? Plank. Not just kidding. See, this is why I failed. <laughs> no, no, you're, you're, you're okay. You're okay. What do you think, Thomas? Yeah, I thought it was the blank too. Yeah, that is actually the right answer. So here's the thing. Here's why it's somewhat of a trick question. I threw one of the options in there was the stability, stability ball, ball crunch. Yeah. So when somebody hears stability ball, they like, oh, that's it. When you think stabilization, right? Yeah. But if you look in your book, and, and Thomas, you'll remember this. I've, I've said this a couple of times, oh, right? Stalker. It's, mm -hmm. what's, it's, it's not about what piece of equipment you're using or whether that equipment is unstable or stable for what makes something core stabilization or what makes something core strength or what makes something core power is the fact that you either don't move your spine, you do move your spine or you move your spine fast. So we picked, you know, one exercise that moved the spine fast. That was the medicine ball overhead throw. The hanging leg raise and the stability ball crunch both moved the spine. So those are strength. And then the plank is the only one that's stabilization. So that's as close to a trick question as they'll ever ask you, because like they did throw something that they know people will be drawn to in there. Um, and I've actually seen that question. In fact, I've put that question in homeworks before. Um, but uh, that's, they don't, we don't do trick. NASM can't do trick questions. They would get in big trouble if they did. <laughs> but right. it's just like the rewording that kind of got to me. Yeah, it's all about the reward. It's all about the wording. So I think you're in a good spot, Eddie. I wouldn't worry too much about it. Appreciate it. Especially because it's your first mod too. Like this stuff only gets better the longer you're here, you know? Cool. Awesome. All right. So looking at our 12, uh, not our 12 days, an eight day class. So here's the thing. We went through it from a 12 day class. We're moving into an eight day class. So the way this is going to work is we're going to have to our intro day today. Tomorrow, uh, we'll do uh, how to work with multiple conditions. So we'll talk, this is actually sort of a concept day here. These two feel very similar. It's almost like this class gets two days of intro um, because this is really just gonna be kind of talking about what it means to, to you know, uh, prescribe the specific exercises. Um, and then this is over here is like, you know, kind of a concept. It's like, well, what if my client has osteoarthritis and osteoporosis oh. and diabetes and they're pregnant? You know, <laughs> like, what do we do if they have all of these problems, right? Um, so it'll be kind of the concept of like how to deal with that. Hey, uh, Brad, I'm getting a point of call. Can I just uh, call, jump back in in a second? Sure, no sweat. Okay, thank you. Um, so then we get day three, we're going to talk and then, and then we're going to start breaking down our, our specific pops, right? So we're going to break down youth and senior populations, how to work with o the obese diabetes, uh, clients and pregnant clients. Uh, we'll do hypertension, coronary heart disease, and what's called peripheral arterial disease, um, varicose veins and things like that, uh, on day five osteoporosis and arthritis on day six. And then we'll work with like cancer and specific types of lung disease, on day uh, seven there. And then we'll have our review and our final exam. So this is going to be, I'll actually change that. I got, it always says review, but I'll change it to 
in person meet up and final exam. So that is going to be oh, red. So our in person meetup is going to be, let's see, this is day one, day two, three, four, five, six, seven. It's going to be on a Monday. I hate it when they fall on Mondays. Uh, it's going to be on Monday the 18th. <laughs> um, so that's our next in person meetup. Uh, so Monday. So next week, we're not seeing you at all. Yeah, it looks like next week. This is that. That's, it's a. It fell kind of weird this time, um, so we're gonna miss next week. But we're gonna see Monday, October eighth, eighteenth, uh, at nine a.m. morning slash six p.m. for you. Um. So that's our in-person meetup right there, right? Um. And then that'll also be obviously like the final exam. Um, now, one thing I want to point out to my new students, uh, take a look right here, guys. You will see if you look at the schedule, we've got homework one is on day two, right? That's going to be 15 questions uh, from PowerPoints one through two, right? Ah, I'm sorry. Uh, then we're going to see uh, homework two is also going to be 15 questions from PowerPoints three through four. And homework three is going to be 15 questions from homeworks uh, for PowerPoints five through six. So here's what you'll, you'll probably notice about this. Um, there is no midterm in this class, right? This is only an eight day class. It's not a 12 day class. So because of the size, we are actually only going to do three pieces of homework, but one thing you'll notice is like the final exam over here, right, is going to uh, in person. You know, I'll do let's go like this. Oh, wait, no, not like that. Ah. <laughs> uh, the in person, um, I'm sorry, not the in person, but the final exam. Uh, this final exam is going to be 30 questions, just like all of our tests are. But you will notice it's going to go from PowerPoints 1 all the way through PowerPoint uh, 6 there. So it's going to cover the entire course, basically. So now yeah. you know, we know that like 15 yeah. questions are going to be familiar, just like it was last time, right? Half the questions yeah. are the homeworks. But now you have three homeworks to review instead of just two. So we're actually kind of pushing your ability to memorize. Like before, you only had to look at homework one or two, and that would help. Now you have to work at homework one, two, three. Um, oh, no. So we're kind of working on that <laughs> a little bit, right? Um, yeah. A little bit different, you know? Um, but trust me that it's not much more difficult. You know what I mean? Yeah. Oh, my God. What is going on with my hands today? I cannot type. Um, so there we go. That is, uh, that's our day by day. That's, that's where we're headed over the schedule. I will send this out in today's email as well. Um, so you guys can, can have a copy of this and make sure that, uh, you understand it and stuff, but, uh, any questions on that? No, thank you. Cool. Cool. Yeah, I'm good. Uh -huh. All right. So saving that. And by the way, this says PowerPoints, uh, for the homework. I will say there are actually, uh, finally, um, some actual chapters on this. Uh, if you look in your book, I, I, let me see here. I believe it's uh, some chapter. On the NASA book, right? The same one? Yeah. Oh, that's professional development. Shoot. Uh, chapter 13. Oh, no. That's supplementation. I was way off. Uh, chapter 17? <laughs> Nutrition 16. Oh, I did say it was chapter 20. I, I was wrong. It's chapter 16. So there is like in your regular book, chapter 16. Um, this will also have the same information. You'll see this, the, the tables that are going to be in our PowerPoints when we get there. Uh, like I'll open it. Let me open up uh, one of the later PowerPoints just so you can see it. Um, let's see here. 106. We'll go to like day here. Um, so we'll see these old tables that look like this. Uh, and it's like, here's all your modifications you're going to make. 
Um, so you'll see those tables in your chapter 16. So, uh, but you only have to read like maybe one or two pages. It's not much. Chapter 16, right. which is um, chronic health condition and physical or functional limitations. Yep, that's, that's the one. Today, you don't even have to like dive into that. Today, you don't have to do okay. anything. Um, it's all just going to be PowerPoint stuff. Uh, but yeah, tomorrow it'll be, or not, not tomorrow either, actually. Both of the first two days, you don't have to, to dive in too much to the special population stuff. Um, but on Monday, it'll help to read like the first two pages of that chapter. Gotcha. Okay. Um, so let's go ahead and uh, break it down. Um, so looking at it, uh, like I said, we're looking at PFT 106's first day here. This is going to be all about understanding uh, the, the basics or sort of like what it means to, to work with special populations, right? Uh, and you can see, like I said, it's a pretty gentle day. Uh, it's really only three pages here. Um, it's kind of nice, uh, considering that we had like seven pages of notes one day last week. Uh, <laughs> so um, as we're looking at it, uh, we are going to be kind of breaking down a little bit about like what it means to, to sort of like, you know, write out these workouts. And then we're going to find something that's actually not in your textbook here. Um, we're going to have a little bit of information that is not NASM, uh, uh, not covered in your NASM, but I will say like, if you ever work in physical therapy, uh, like if you work in a physical therapy office as like a, an aide or something like that, or if you actually just work in like any clinical style setting, um, there's going to be some stuff called soap notes that are sort of a, a, a they're an alternative choice to like the, the, the workout template that I showed you yesterday. Um, so I'll kind of show you what that looks like in a, in a little bit here, but, um, so when I'm talking about special populations, we are just, just briefly talking about the, uh, the whole epidemiology of things here, right? It's estimated that we got about 90 million Americans and that's, this is an old statistic. It is way higher than that now. Uh, but at the time of writing this, we had about 90 million Americans, uh, that are living with some type of chronic health condition which is crazy if you think about it. Like that's, that's a substantial amount of people. Um, and that number is obviously, it said will likely to rise in the future. Uh, that absolutely did happen. Uh, it has definitely gone up much higher than that. Um, even though there are these advances with like modern medicine, right? Like we are actually living longer despite like, you know, living unhealthier. And that's just because like medicine is sort of, you know, kind of, dragging us over the finish line in a way you know what i mean um not that we're necessarily living like our best lives right and so what we know about like you know the fact that like medications and me modern medicine and things like that are keeping us living longer we know there's just going to be more people out there in the world that are going to have uh you know specific chronic health conditions that that they're going to need help with right so um whoop. Uh, so yeah, so that, that number is definitely like climbing. And so we are here to sort of like address, you know, those populations through exercise, right? No, we're not treating the disease, right? Um, one of the big things that we want to remember, you know, it's like if I had a client and, uh, they have, a, they have diabetes, right. And they come to me and they're like, Hey, I have diabetes. I'm like, okay. They're like, you know, I've heard that, you know, my doctor said that I need to start exercising because it's going to be really good for my diabetes. I'm like, great, let's do it. Am I treating diabetes directly? No, like I don't, I'm not prescribing insulin to my client, right? I'm not, I'm not, you know, putting them on, uh, you know, a specific nutritional plan, um, but I'm there to give them general dietary advice and say like, hey, like, you know, we know that like diabetes is all about like managing blood sugar. So here's a list of really low glycemic index foods. These are the types of foods that are going to have less impact on your blood sugar. And they're like, oh, okay, great. And it's just a helpful resource that I gave them. Right. And then I'm going to encourage them to exercise regularly with me and be like, hey, we do know that diabetes can be reduced when your body fat gets within normal ranges because abdominal fat in particular is sort of associated with diabetes. Uh, and they go, oh, okay, yeah, well, let's, let's, get, let's work on a weight loss routine, great. So then we work together for, let's say a year, right? Just for the sake of it. Um, and a year later, my client is, you know, maybe 50 pounds lighter. 
uh, you know, they, they don't need as much insulin as they used to. In fact, now like they've gone to their doctor and the doctor's like, yeah, we've been lowering your medication. We're going to take you off insulin. Now, did we cure their diabetes? No, of course not. But we treated through general exercise, um, you know, the, the, the disease got better, you know, so we absolutely had like a positive impact on it. That's our approach to diseases as a personal trainer. We're not doctors, we're not therapists, right? We're not dietitians either. But through like education and coaching, we are leading people to live their best, healthiest lives. I know I hate sometimes I hate saying that phrase because it feels like I'm I'm like an Instagram, you know, <laughs> I sound like an Instagram <laughs> post where I'm like, you're gonna lead your best life, you know. <laughs> like, um, but that's, that's cool. really that's what, <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, right? yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm an Instagram cover photo right now. Uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> what's that? Oh, nothing, nothing. Oh, yeah. Uh, but yeah, but, but okay. no, really, that's what we're doing. Through general exercise, because here's the thing. Here's what I like to tell people all the time. Um, this, is, this is a phrase that I've been using. For, I, I stole this from somebody, but I've been using it for years. Um, you know, uh, a lot of times, like, weight loss shouldn't necessarily be the goal, you know? Instead, I, like, my belief is that weight loss is a byproduct of an overall healthy lifestyle. Rather than focusing on like, you know, doing this or doing that or doing this, focus on, you know, living your, like the, again, like your best version of, you know, becoming the best version of yourself. When you focus on those things, all that other stuff will happen naturally because, you know, function follows form, you know? <laughs> um, yeah. So that's, that's sort of what we're talking about here. Now today um, we are going to be looking at a very brief into, oh, if there's actually even less we're gonna be looking at a very brief introduction to all of these diseases that we're going to be looking at in this course um i'm just going to kind of rattle on them off and talk about them a little bit that way they'll sound a little more familiar when they come back around throughout the rest of the course um so you guys know how much we do like intro slides uh well this is like an intro to the whole course um so the leading cause of death in the u.s right is cardiovascular disease right that's the number one and, you know, that's, that's the number one killer of adults in the U.S., right? Cardiovascular disease. And there's a couple of reasons for that. Number one, cardiovascular dis uh, is, disease is um, a group of diseases, you know? So, like, obviously, it's going to have, like, a large number, it, you know, is, is um, you know, uh, an actual, like, coronary, uh, a, a blocked coronary artery the leading cause of death. Maybe, yeah, uh, oftentimes, right? Uh, what about just general hypertension? You know, that also falls under that category as well. Um, but it's definitely the leading cause of death, right? This is the, the number one thing that's taking us out. And this is an example of like kind of what I talked about when I was talking about injuries. Non-contact injuries really shouldn't happen. You know, like if I didn't get hit, I shouldn't have gotten hurt. My body should be able to like, I should be able to step into a hole without, you know, tearing my ACL. Well, you know, um, but if I don't, I don't ever do anything for my ankle. I don't teach my, you know, don't have any core strength. I don't have any balance or stability. Of course I'm going to get hurt. That's how I feel about coronary artery disease as well. You know, like this is something that really shouldn't happen, but we, we eat very unhealthy. We don't, we, you know, we leave that cholesterol laying around in our body and then it gets, you know, blocking into our arteries. We don't have a heart strong enough to actually pump stuff around, you know, and clean off the walls of our arteries. And so, you know, plaque just starts building up. We look at like coronary artery disease. What we're going to see are a bunch of pictures of like, you know, uh, plaque on the inside of these blood vessels, right? And so like, this is just like leftover cholesterol just parking itself in our blood vessels. And if it ever gets bad enough to where it like is a full blockage, right? We're going to end up with like a blood clot because blood cells are meant to clot together. And uh, that can actually like block blood, uh, oxygen delivery. And then we see cell death, you know, um, all of the cells that are turning black right here are, you know, not getting enough oxygen. Um, and so those cells are, are dying, you know, uh, and that's what a heart attack is. That's, that's what coronary artery disease sort of leads to. Um, so it's the, definitely the, the biggest thing, right? And so 53%, by the way, right? Look at that, 53% um, of, of, of cardiovascular disease 
uh, is from coronary artery disease. And then we see all the other heart disease. Uh, what percentage of Americans die from uh, cardiovascular disease? So we're seeing, uh, I need an image, give me a chart. <laughs> Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. All right. Oh, that's smoking. These are too many charts. These are too many different separate statistics. I just want to know. Ah. Nope. Oh, wrong chart as well. Just tell me how. Okay. <laughs> we know it's the leading cause of death. Uh, 659,000 people. To, that's one in four. 25% of people. And then 53% of that 25% is coronary heart disease. So big problem here, right? Um, and here's the thing. If somebody was born with like a valvular defect that one day just like happened to break, sure. Okay, that's, you know, they didn't do anything outside of like a normal healthy lifestyle, but they, they had a bad luck of a draw, you know? Um, surely there are some people out there but we see this number climbing and climbing, climbing and climbing. Um, and it's just something that like we want to fix through a general, you know, all it requires is like a generally healthy lifestyle, you know? So that's, that's really what we're working on here. We're, we're trying to get uh, this healthy lifestyle. Okay. So uh, the Center for Disease Control, it's the CDC supports that like physical inactivity is one of the major underlying causes here. If we see this number continually going up and we're asking ourselves why, why is this number keep freaking climbing every single year? The biggest reason that we've sort of come up with is the fact that like we just see Americans living an even more sedentary lifestyle every year. We sit and sit and sit longer and longer and longer. And so because of that, you know, we are getting unhealthier every single solitary day, right? Um, so that's definitely something uh, we want to address through getting our clients more physically active. So clearly living an active, fit, healthy lifestyle is going to be better for us. It's going to reduce our, our risk of morbidity and mortality. Um, we also know that like, um, you know, uh, exercise can benefit us in other ways as well, right? It can have positive effects on our mood. It can obviously help you move better. Um, and just like, you know, uh, less aches and less pains, which means that you will be more generally physically active. Um, one of the statistics we're going to see in our next class, when we get to seniors, uh, we're going to talk about how dangerous like breaking your hip is. Um, and here's the thing, obviously breaking any bone is a big deal, but there's actually something specific about breaking the hip because it's so painful and there's really no avoiding the pain associated with like a hip fracture. Um, it was just no putting your leg down that we see people about 25% of people actually die within one calendar year of a hip fracture, which is a crazy high statistic. And that's like really severe. And it's like, well, what happened? Is it just the bone? And it's like, has honestly nothing to do with the bone, except for the fact that like, it makes everything in life hurt a little bit more. And so then they just stay in bed, they don't move. And when we don't move, that kills us. It's the unhealthiest yeah. thing we can do. Um, I know it's kind of a bummer today, by the way. So we're talking about a lot of diseases we have. <laughs> That's good. I like that. Yeah. Yeah. You know, some, time. yeah, sometimes bummers are wake up calls, you know, I know that like nobody in this like has like a problem with these things, you know, um, yeah. you know, we're all movers. And I mean, we know family who do, so it's like very helpful to explain like, Hey, you know, right? they're teaching us these things that they don't teach us in regular school. So Dude. like, this is a thing. Right? Like the real pandemic should be this. Yeah. Like people should Seriously. be sitting on their ass to go move and, and stuff yeah. like that. Like I don't know. Yeah, see now you know when when grandma or grandpa breaks a hip, how many put them in a wheelchair, <laughs> take them outside, you know? Take them yeah, outside. Yeah, no, it's gonna be like literally, literally they do, and it's gonna be like, you gotta do your physical therapy, get back yeah. off your feet. I know it hurts. Let's go, you know? Yeah, yeah. absolutely. I mean, yeah. Um, so common diseases that we're gonna run into. One of the big ones is going to be hypertension. So hypertension is more commonly referred to as like high blood pressure. Um, and then clinically, how we're going to define this, it's going to be anytime that blood pressure is 140 over 90. So that is going to be our sort of definition of, of, of high blood pressure. Ideally, your blood pressure should be somewhere around 120 over 80. 
So okay. that's that's sort of what we consider to be like normal ranges. But if it gets as high as this, um, even though your client is like resting and stuff, um, that's where we know it's like a problem. Now, here's the thing, just so you guys understand blood pressure. Um, if you like deadlift, if you're in the middle of like a deadlift, for instance, and you do that like Valsalva maneuver, you take a big deep breath in and you kind of exhale really, really hard and it like creates all that intra-abdominal pressure and stuff. The highest recorded, I think it was like 400 something. Um, oh shit. So yeah. is that what happens to like a lot of us that lifting? Yes. So your blood pressure will spike like, okay, the highest recorded was 370 over 360. It's oh crazy my God. High, right. It's crazy high. Here's the thing. Does that mean that that person's like unhealthy? No. We call that essential hypertension. Uh, anytime you hear the term essential in like health or biology or whatever, uh, it means that it like needed to happen in that moment. It was essential that it occurred, right? Um, yeah. We'll talk about essential vitamins and minerals. They're essential to your diet. So that's the good type of blood pressure. Your blood pressure will spike over certain times, which is why your doctor has you sit for about five minutes before they actually take your blood pressure. They have you like sit down, relax, you know? Um, there was definitely like a time where like, even I, like I went in to get my blood pressure test because I get my checkup or something. And I remember just like sitting down and then they took my blood pressure immediately and being the competitive, like numbers based person that I am, they were like, Oh, it's like 125 over 80. And I was like, uh, we're going to take a second and we're going to take that again. <laughs> <laughs> Cause I've only been sitting here for like 30 seconds. Like you're supposed to let me sit. And he was like, the nurse was like, like not happy with me it's like who are you <laughs> it's like i'm a very competitive about my health person yeah so the weird thing about me it's like apparently it's like i forgot what they call it it's called like uh, uh what are they called it's like some type of syndrome where like people just they get anxious i guess or something or nervous going to the doctor and then they still have like their blood pressure a little bit high not, not, mm. not too high but like you know it's like bro like that i usually see it like 110 115 and that's like 120 like it's not right, but I know that I'm healthy. It's just that. Sure. I guess every yeah, time some people awkward, like anxiety. Like, yeah, it'll get you, you know? Yeah, uh, yeah, and that's the thing. You can raise your blood pressure. You know, if you guys ever want to cheat on your blood pressure, by the way, uh, this is true. <laughs> you can, if you ever want your blood pressure to be higher for some reason, just hold your breath. Oh, like, yeah. Yeah. Um, hold your breath before going in there. Your blood pressure will spike naturally. You want to lower what it, is take a couple deep breaths and relax. Yeah. What about a... Uh, you know, like lie detector, lie detectors. Yeah, that goes off like your blood pressure too, kind of, right? Yeah, it's like a combination of stuff. I actually don't know how those things yeah. work. Yeah. Um, so maybe if they ever hook you up to one, you just start breathing all fast, like. <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> I do know that those tests are BS, though. <laughs> yeah, bro. They're gonna they're gonna do whatever they want with you, really. Yeah, they've 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 kind of shown those things to not be very effective multiple times. I think even yeah, the guy who invented it actually came out afterwards and was like, "Yeah, I <laughs> no way, dude." Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so if you hold your breath, yeah, your blood pressure goes up, huh? Yep. And if you take nice calming breaths, it'll it'll come back down. Yeah. All right. Um. So, uh, diabetes this is another common disease we're going to run into a lot. Uh, impaired glucose control. So there's going to be two types of diabetes out there. Uh, there's type one, which is where your body actually doesn't produce enough insulin. Uh, and then there's type two, where your body has actually become resistant to insulin. So the way insulin works, right? Um, you know, if you look at uh, how insulin works, right? If we think about like, you know, how our blood glucose levels are, right? So let's take a look right here. This is a, a chart that I'll pull up sometimes, but you can see, right, we've got like breakfast, lunch, and dinner. This is like the time of day down here on the bottom chart, right? So your blood pressure, your blood sugar is going up and it's going down all day. You know, um, like I just had this coffee. I had, it had milk and it had sugar in it. So my blood sugar spiked up a little bit, you know? Um, but as like, what's going to happen is like, my body is going to go, oh, our blood glucose levels are elevated. So then what it will do is it will create insulin in response. And insulin is a hormone in your blood that is designed to drive sugar out of your blood, blood. drive it into your cells. So our cells need sugar in order to like, you know, run themselves, right? That's their fuel in the same way that gasoline for your car, right? So glucose is going to need to drive it. Oop. Hey, Mir, I'm getting a little bit of feedback. Can you just uh, hit the Oh, yeah, sorry. Yeah, no sweat. 
Um, so we uh, we we um, we we drive that sugar out of our blood, which is now just kind of flowing around in our blood, right? Like you eat like a piece of bread or something, your body breaks it down into sugar. That sugar passes into your blood. Now it's running around your blood, but I need to get it into my cells in order to like utilize that energy, right? So your body will create insulin and insulin will drive that sugar out of your blood. Now, <clears throat> if it goes into your cells to be used for energy, great, we're, we're good to go, right? If it drives it in there to become like glycogen, which is like stored, you know, glucose that we can use for energy later. Great. We love that. But if your glycogen stores are full and you have no reason to use that sugar in this moment, well, what will happen instead is your body will go, all right, well, the insulin is going to drive that sugar out of your blood, but it doesn't have anywhere to go. So what it'll do is it will convert it into fat cells instead. It'll convert it into triglycerides. And that's why high sugar foods are associated with obesity. Um, because like if your glycogen stores are full, you haven't moved around to burn through them. You know, you haven't done any physical activity. Let's you know, we're living a sedentary lifestyle and you have a high sugar meal. That sugar has nowhere to go except to get converted into body fat. Um, so we're actually seeing that right here, right? You can see the blue line is representing, uh, glucose levels and the red line is representing, um, uh, I'm sorry, the blue line is representing insulin and the red line is representing glucose. So if the blood sugar gets high, your body will produce insulin in response. And you'll notice that both of them will then drop, right? As the insulin gets used up, the blood sugar is driving down, right? And now blood sugar is kind of low, right? And so this person's getting a little bit hungry, right? So then maybe they eat like a small something. And so because they ate like a small something, the body makes a little bit of insulin in response. Doesn't make a ton of insulin. Right here, this is clearly like a high sugar. This person had like frosted flakes for breakfast, right? So whew, blood sugar just spiked like crazy, really rapidly, right? Which is why, look at how the insulin line kind of like, kind of gu it gets up above the red line here. That is showing that like, oh, you brought in so much sugar so quickly, your body decided to make a ton of insulin in response, right? Uh, it's kind of trying to play catch up, you know? So then what ended up happening is, you know, that uh, drove all the sugar out of your blood. You ended up right back to where you started, which was like hungry. But lucky, we had maybe a small little snack here because that wasn't as like blood sugar impactful. It was like a small sort of, you know, regulated snack. We didn't need to create tons of insulin in response, but it still, you know, drove the sugar out. And so that's great. And so then we're slowly burning through it. And then you notice these dotted lines here. This is showing you the difference between like what would happen if you ate like a starchy food versus what would happen if you ate like uh, another bowl of frosted flakes, right? Like just sugar. So if it's a starchy food, see how it's like kind of normal, right? Like our blood sugar goes up because it does have carbs in it, but it didn't go beyond like any normal healthy ranges. And so it can drop back to normal, right? But look at what happened here. This dotted line, if you eat a bowl of frosted flakes, it spikes your blood sugar levels so high that your body freaks out, makes a ton of insulin in response. And then look what happened to your blood sugar levels afterwards because you created so much insulin, it drove all of the sugar out of your blood. So anytime our blood sugar gets low, we get hunger cravings, right? So now we start to see, like if we look at a chart like this, the more often we eat these high sugar foods, the more likely we are to drive all of the sugar out of our blood, get massive hunger cravings and eat more high sugar foods because we feel like we need the energy. And then we never, you know, we're just going up and down and up and down rather than eating maybe small meals that are throughout the day, which, you know, only raise our blood sugar levels sort of moderately, right? Um, if we're eating like healthy carbohydrates, <clears throat> you know, our blood sugar levels stay within normal ranges. So this is a really good chart to kind of show that in like very big detail, but, you know, sort of a more simplified version. There we go. Let's just look at one sort of normal line here, right? So anytime your glucose gets up, your body will make insulin, which will drive it down. Right. And then once it gets down, your body will say, Hey, we are hungry. And then that'll raise it back up. That's sort of the relationship there. Right. 
Uh, anytime it gets above this line, insulin is created in response. Anytime it gets below this line, hunger is created in response, right? Um, now, the higher you go above this line, the farther you are going to dip below this line in response later on. So that's what diabetes is. Diabetes is where you have impaired glucose control. Now, there's two versions of this. Type one diabetes is sort of what you're born with. Um, it's where unfortunately you kind of have a bum pancreas. Your pancreas, by the way, is what creates insulin. That's the, the organ responsible for, for creating that insulin. Type one diabetes, your, your pancreas just isn't creating insulin the way it's supposed to, unfortunately. So what ends up happening is sugar just stays around in your blood. Now that may not sound like it's that big a deal, but it's gumming up the works, right? Remember like your blood's job is to carry oxygen and nutrients and things like that around your body. If you fill it with sugar, it's not gonna be very good at carrying all those other things. It's gonna have a really hard time carrying around what it needs to carry, mostly oxygen. So it can actually gum up the work so much that your cells start to suffocate. And that's why we see uh, diabetes is a metabolic disorder. Um, so what can happen, this is going to be a little bit of a disturbing picture, by the way, just heads up for everybody who wants to turn their camera off or whatever. Um, but you can end up with like a diabetic ulcer, which is where basically your body doesn't repair very quickly. Um, because the diabetes, because the sugar is present in your blood, it is keeping normal physiologic processes from happening. Uh, so type one diabetes, your body doesn't make enough insulin. Therefore, it doesn't drive the sugar out of your blood. Type 2 diabetes, you have created insulin so often and so much of it that your pancreas, your pancreas is working fine. It's a totally normal functioning pancreas. But your body's cells have actually become resistant to that insulin. It doesn't work the way it's supposed to anymore. Uh, in the same way that like, you know, we were talking about coffee earlier, you know, like this caffeine does not have the same effect on me as it did when I first started drinking coffee, <laughs> you know, um, I need a little bit more than I used to, to kind of feel the same thing because my body has become resistant to it, you know, um, just like people who get like certain addictions, you know, they need more and more and more to get the same feeling that they used to. Right. Um, that's how your insulin starts acting inside of your blood. You've created so much insulin so often that your body cells have actually become resistant to that insulin. And that's what we're seeing in type two diabetes. Type two diabetes, by the way, most cases are type two diabetes, uh, which is crazy. This is a disease that we you know, developed um, through like a poor diet and yet, uh, And yet 90 to 95% of all cases are type two. That's crazy, right? If we had people who are not eating so much sugar and eating so poorly, diabetes wouldn't even be a problem. And yet 90 to 95% of cases, the 5% of people that would have diabetes just because they were born with it, um, we wouldn't really have a problem. You know, we could treat that very easily, but there are millions of people in the, in the U S particularly, um, uh, who are dealing with this diabetes, you know, diabetes. So that's kind of crazy. Um, and that's one of the reasons why we got to talk about diet in later mods. <laughs> uh, next disease we're going to cover is we're saying it's, it's hyperlipidemia here. Sometimes you'll hear this referred to as dyslipidemia. Dys is, dys stands for dysfunction. Uh, this is also much more commonly referred to uh, as high cholesterol. So cholesterol is actually a very essential part of our physiology. We love cholesterol normally. So, uh, you're going to see there's a difference between what is called HDL cholesterol and LDL cholesterol. And what cholesterol is, right. Um, is it is, uh, it's, 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 it's lipoproteins. Okay. Um, and so there's the good stuff over here. That's your HDL. And there's the bad stuff over here. That's your LDL. And so, um, 
what HDL cholesterol is. We, hold on, I want to see a picture of the two of them side by side. Give me the picture. There we go. So if you look, you can see HDL is a little bit smaller, LDL is a little bit larger. And then you'll notice there's actually more cholesterol. So there's more proteins on this left side over here. And then, you know, these, these little blue things right here, there's more proteins in the high density stuff. And then the low density stuff, we see way less proteins and we see more triglycerides, these little brown guys here. And then we see more cholesterols, these little like yellow guys here present in the LDL. So what HDL stands for is it's your high density lipoproteins. That's the good stuff. Think of it as like something that's so dense that as it's flowing through your blood vessels, it's cleaning off the walls, you know? Um, like, uh, have you guys ever used, this is weird. I don't, there's a, there's a, gonna be a weird analogy for this, but have you guys ever used like salt to clean like a pan? You ever done that? Um, something yeah, that works. Rainy? Yeah, like, yeah, I do stuff, yeah, right, super effective, yeah, yeah. right? Um, yeah, so it's very grainy, it's very dense, it's like a it's like little rocks, you're using little stones to create some grit to clean things off, right? That's mm -hmm. kind of what HDL is, right? Water wasn't cutting it, water's not very dense, that's why it's a liquid, right? Um, so if you're yeah. just trying to scrub with that, it just it wasn't working very well, so you go get something gritty and it, it scrapes off the thing. That's kind of how HDL and LDL are acting inside your blood. HDL is so dense that as it's flowing through your blood vessels, it really kind of cleans off the walls of those blood vessels. So, you know, if you look at it, right, you can see little cholesterols are flowing through our blood vessels. But here, look at all this plaque, the stuff that's built up on the walls. LDL cholesterol, it's not very dense. So it doesn't flow through our blood very well. And eventually what it starts to do What it starts to do is it starts to build up and become what we call plaque, okay? So here's like a normal artery, right? Uh, it's empty, right? I mean, blood would be flowing through here, nutrients, water, sugar, you know, glucose, uh, maybe some insulin, right? And cholesterols. But then what we start to see um, is cholesterol start to build. Actually, that's showing what happens when there's a tear. Hold on. That is the picture I want, but there we go. Um, so what starts to happen is we start to get what's called a fatty streak. Cholesterol, the low density cholesterol starts to kind of build up. Okay. And so, you know, that low density one grabs that one and then that one grabs that one. And then they just kind of park themselves on our blood vessel. So then it starts building up more and more and more until eventually the entire thing is filled and we might end up with like a blood clot, right? And our blood cells start getting all stuck together. And then all of a sudden the entire vessel can no longer like carry blood because there's no room, right? Um, the, the tube is filled. So, you know, high density cholesterol will come along and it'll clean that off. It's like pipe cleaner. It'll go in and it'll get that low density stuff knocked off the walls. And for the record, we need low density lipoproteins. Like I say, it's the bad cholesterol, but like we do need it. It serves a function in our body. We just live in a world where we, you know, just like sugar, sugar serves a function in our physiology, but we live in a world where we've just got way too much of this stuff. Um, and so it's building up on, on the walls of our blood vessels and eventually it's blocking our tubes, you know? Um, so think of HDL as high density stuff. That's the good stuff. Uh, and think of low density, the LDL. Um, I always call that LDL, I think lazy density lipoproteins. Like it's lazy and it's getting, it's just parking itself on our blood vessels. Um, so we need the HDL to, to do, by the way, your cholesterol is how you synthesize things like testosterone. So we like cholesterol. It is a good thing. We just live in a version of the world where we've created way too much of it. It's not great for us anymore. Um, so that's, that's why I actually don't like the term hyperlipidemia personally. I like the term dyslipidemia. It's dysfunctional lipoproteins. We need lipoproteins. They're a good thing. Um, so just having lots of them isn't even necessarily a bad thing, as long as the ratio of good stuff to bad stuff, as long as that ratio is within normal ranges, you're in a good spot. Um, but dyslipidemia, dysfunctional, it's like, okay, well, now we've tipped the ratio. We're in a bad, we're in a bad spot. 
Um, so those are probably the three most common that we're going to run into. Obviously, there's other special populations out there that we're going to look at, uh, but those are some of the, the most common ones. So I want to ask you a question here. Um, now that we understand a little bit about these diseases, it might make you think that, like, you might be like, all right, well, then I want to get rid of all these diseases, right? And I want to make sure that I'm basing all my exercise selection, basing my entire routine on curing these diseases, right? But again, remember, we're not curing things. Um, so I want to ask you a question here. This is a discussion question. Uh, how could only using a medical condition as the basis for your programming, how can that be a bad thing? If you focus on the diagnosis only when it comes to writing a routine for your client, how can that be? We call that diagnosis oriented. Uh, how can that be a bad thing? Well, we think the negative can it, does it have to be like a like diabetes related or can we talk about anything right now? Let's say it is that di- we can talk about anything right now, but let's just say, let's use diet. Yeah. What if your client says, Oh, I have diabetes. And then that's the only thing you focus on. How can that be a bad thing? Because well, it restricts you from getting the other benefits that you would get from the other exercises. Yeah, absolutely. That's one way. Yeah. I love that. That's a great answer. Yeah, like, like their diet, right? Their diet is what's causing them diabetes, right? Yeah. So I'm not just going to give them a, a book. That's like healthy cooking. You're going to make right. them come to the gym and work out and, and then they're going like, to want to eat what? healthy because it's part of it, you know? Yeah, absolutely. That's yeah. also very good. It's like yeah. if a guy says he has a small chest and then you bring him into the gym every single day and just look <laughs> at his chest and never let it heal. You nailed it. Yeah, both of you guys. Right? Yeah. I love it. Good yeah. answers, guys. Thank you. Um, so we got a whole list of, of ways it's bad. <laughs> So di- we call this diagnosis-oriented exercise management. Okay, uh, it is, and what you know to break that down. What I mean by that is it's fitness programming or fitness program design based solely on a client's disease or condition, rather than basing the program on the individual themselves. So you could have two clients with diabetes, but one of them is managing it really well, and the other one is not managing it well at all. And if you make the routine that you're writing the same for both of them, you're not being specific. That's not specific to the client, right? Um, So that's not going to be good. The disadvantages here um, is that it makes it very difficult for you to, number one, here's the other thing. Like, what if they have diabetes and hypertension and osteoporosis and what if they have a lot of different things? And like, you know, the rule for this tells you that you're not allowed to do this. And then the rule for that tells you, it's like, well, then we can't do anything. Goodbye. You know, like, that's not good, right? Right? Like, um, so that's not good, right? Um, it will mess up your perception of what your client is capable of. That's not good, right? So then all of a sudden you're like, oh, well, we got to be careful about this. And then you're so cautious that you never do anything. That's not great. Uh, and it makes it very difficult. Uh, you know, it, it negatively affects the trainer's perception of your client's capabilities, right? You're like, oh, well, I don't know. You're just, you know, you're going to be bad at all this stuff. Right. And that's, that's not good. We don't like that. Um, and it labels your client. And this is, this is the one that I think is most relevant to us. It labels your client as dysfunctional rather than labeling them as measurably functional. Like if you were to look at my ability to play basketball compared to like LeBron James, You'd be like, you'd be like, oh, he, you're so bad at this compared to LeBron that you're dis, like you're, you know, <laughs> like, like you're dysfunctional, right? And it's like, yeah. I'm not functional. I'm measurably functional. No, of course I'm not as good, right? Um, of course not, you know. But at the same time, it doesn't mean that, like, you know, this, there's a difference between dysfunctional and measurably functional. Like if I was dysfunctional, I shouldn't play basketball. If I'm measurably functional, I should play basketball with that group over there who is also in my skill set. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. It's like if you let somebody as dysfunctional, be like, oh, you shouldn't lift weights. That is dumb. It's dumb. But what about lifting five pound weights? Just because you can't lift 150 pounds overhead doesn't mean you can't start with a little five pound weight. You know what I mean? yeah that's that's one of the reasons why we do not like this so i want to caution you guys 
into falling into this trap, which is a trap that I fell into when I started my career. Um, it's a trap that a lot of trainers find themselves in all the time where they look at their clients like disease or condition or whatever, and they solely base everything on that. And it's like, you know, you could have a client with diabetes who is also able to run, you know, uh, maybe they're able to run, you know, a, a, a 15 second hundred meter dash, you know, it's pretty quick. <laughs> they could be a great sprinter, even if they have diabetes, you know, um, maybe they're the exception to the rule. You know what I mean? Um, so that's where diagnosis oriented gets us in trouble. Instead, what we want to focus on more is we call it POEM. This is problem oriented exercise management. Cause then we also don't want to go too far in the other direction either. We don't want to go all the way to the left where we're avoiding exercise because of someone's disease. We also don't going to want to go all the way to the right where we're like not considering their diseases. Right? <laughs> like, it's like, you know, it's like, you got diabetes? That's fine. Have a cookie. You know, like we also don't want to go too far in that direction. You know? <laughs> we want to be in the middle. <laughs> um, do you know, you guys know, I, I actually, you guys, I don't know if we have talked about this too much. I love barbell lifting. I love power. I think power lifting is actually really fun. Um, you know, or at least using power lifting movements, I think is really, really fun. Do I think that like, that means that I need to start preparing myself for strongman competitions? No. Does it also mean that I want to only do, you know, lightweight, maybe group exercise, like, you know, dumbbells for like 20 to 30 repetitions? No, I think that there's a middle ground where I can lift relatively heavy. I can incorporate dumbbells every now and then kettlebells every now and then. I think that that middle ground of like, you know, taking some of the best parts of powerlifting and the best parts of group exercise and marrying them together. I think that's where we want to be. Uh, and that's what we call problem oriented exercise management. This uses uh, subjective and objective assessments, very clear, very clear fitness assessments to determine the problems that our client has uh, in order to create a plan for how to address them. So now it's like, we are going to do a very clear fitness assessment for our clients, get a really clear idea of like how they are measurably functional. Maybe they're not, you know, as functional again, at, you know, may, you look at me, maybe I'm not as functional as LeBron James, but there's still a version of me that is like, what's hard for me, right? What's good for me? Um, that's what we're looking at where this is problem oriented. So this exercise testing does help us reveal any dysfunctions that our client does have, you know, think about how many guys, you know, are probably really strong, but then they're, you know, they're like, oh, but I can, I couldn't run a mile. Um, right. They're like, I, I could never, you know, I'm just, I'm just not good at cardio. And it's like, you're labeling yourself as dysfunctional. Maybe you're not able to run a mile. That doesn't mean you're dysfunctional when it comes to cardio. What version of cardio is relevant for you? You know, um, maybe running a six minute mile. Yeah, that's not um, in the cards right now. Um, but I'll bet if we just focus on just like jogging slowly and maybe your jogging pace is slower than someone else's walking pace. I don't care. That's fine. That's still your version of a jog. It's still relevant to you. So let's get to a place where we can build up our endurance and get through that right? Maybe that means that your jog is a 12 minute mile. Okay, great. Let's see if we can work that up. So my, our goal now is to get you to be able to consistently run a pace for 12 minutes. And then in six months, maybe that becomes 10 minutes and then eventually eight minutes. And now guess what? We're walking towards that six minute mile, you know, and that's going to take a long time. It's going to take effort, you know, just like, you know, someone saying, oh, I can't bench press. And it's like, what do you mean? And it's like, well, I can only do the bar. Okay, so you can bench press the bar, right? Um, rather than saying I can't bench press, we're we're you know measurably functional over dysfunctional. Um, so exercise testing helps us reveal that. Let's let's get back into the actual. I'm, I'm kind of using examples that are not examples of like conditions or diseases. Let's get back to the special populations version of this. It directs our exercise therapy towards any problems that can be improved through physical activity. Someone tells me they have cardiovascular disease and they're being cautious about like, you know, protecting their heart from exercise. Okay, great. So let's start with walking and then eventually work our way up to lifting weights. 
and then eventually work our way up to maybe doing a little bit of actual like, you know, jogging or walking uphill, right? We build ourselves up. We figure out what's relevant to you and then build from there. Um, it tran and, and what's great about this, guys, is it transforms these problems of, of overwhelming complexity into little components that are very, very manageable. If I got a client with hypertension, high blood pressure, right? I'm going to do some things that are related to improving their blood pressure. Um, it's not going to be the only thing that I focus on, but I'm not going to say, oh, well, that exercise is dangerous for you. You shouldn't do it. That's crazy. That's a crazy approach. And that's where so many people end up, right? That's our first, you know, inclination, right? Um, you guys ever hear, uh, like, what, you know, think about, like, if you have a cold, say, like, common cold, you know, you spend too much time outside, uh, got a chill, now you caught a rhinovirus, right? So you're snotty, you're like, you feel bad, right? Our approach to that is to avoid everything in our life sometimes. It's to get in bed, bring, you know, bring yourself some chicken noodle soup <laughs> and, and wait it out until the whole thing is over. But here's the thing. They've actually shown a little bit of light physical activity going for a walk. You know, don't, don't get me wrong. Don't go near people. Don't infect anybody else. You know, <laughs> uh, but going for like a little bit of an outdoor walk, which is a little bit of physical activity or even like, you know, if a walk isn't hard enough for you, because maybe you're a cardio athlete or something, maybe go for a light jog actually has been shown to reduce the length of a cold. Um, does that mean you should go do like a CrossFit workout? No, <laughs> again, we don't want to go all the way over there. We don't want to go all the way over there. We want to be right here, <laughs> right in the middle. Right. Um, and that is, is, you know, why measuring things is so important. You know, uh, Eddie, what would happen if your rotator cuff, what would happen if we just avoided all shoulder exercises forever? It's not that's good. Not, that's not great, right? What if we spent all day only doing shoulder exercises? That's not even good either because yeah, you're right? working <laughs> it. You got to have a balance and you got to work your way around it somehow and get into specific exercises that would work for you. Yeah, absolutely. Mirror, same thing with your back, right? Um, yep. Yeah. Thomas, I know uh, we, we got tight caps, right? We got a, a tight, I think the one thing I can remember is you got like a slightly tight soleus. <laughs> um, so what if we only spent all of our entire training session working on that? That wouldn't be very effective, right? But what if we also, you know, never addressed it? That's not great either. So, you know, we do a little bit of cap loosening. We go do some squats. We're mostly focused on like quads and glutes there. But we addressed it a little. We're, we're in the middle, right? So um, that is what we like to call problem oriented. We're focusing on things that are problems. If it is a problem that's preventing us from doing things safely, yeah, address it. Um, so this is a, a sort of five-step process here. This is what we're going to be teaching you guys over the next uh, two days. Um, so there's sort of a five-step here. First is the collection of subjective information. Uh, Thomas, that should look very uh, familiar to you. Um, but uh, Eddie and Mir, one thing we're going to teach you when you guys get to your first program design class, once this class is over, we're going to dive into how to train senior clients, which mm. how to train senior clients is the same as training any other client. There's just a couple like rule, rule breaks there. You know, um, first thing you do with any client is you need to gather adequate information. We're going to start with subjective information. Subjective information is measure information that can't be measured. Okay, it's information that is usually opinion based um, or at least is very immeasurable, right? Like if I said Star Wars is the best movie of all time, which I firmly believe, by the way, uh, <laughs> um, and you asked me why, I can't give you measurable information as to why. You know, I can have that opinion, but it's immeasurable, you know? Um, I can't point, you know, it, it's say, or like my occupation. If you said like, Hey, what do you do for a living? And I was like, Oh, I'm a teacher. You can't say how much of a teacher are you, right? There's no way to measure it. There's no way to slap a number on that, you know? Um, so it's subjective and that's still valuable information, right? Somebody has got a disease, right? Um, that's immeasurable information. If they're like, Oh, I have hypertension. Now I can measure what their blood pressure is. And then it becomes objective. 
but like how it affects them, how hypertension is affecting them, whether it makes some one person dizzy versus another person not, uh, or it makes one person feel a little nauseous and another person it doesn't, that's immeasurable. So the disease is subjective, right? Um, and then we've got our objective information. Objective information is measurable, right? If you told me that like, uh, you have uh, like an anterior pelvic tilt. I know that that is very measurable. That is going to decrease activity to your glutes. We talked about that yesterday, right? Um, that's a measurable problem. Or if I said, how much can you bench press? 185 pounds? Okay, number, measurable, right? If I said, how many inches around is your waist? That's very measurable. Okay, so that's the sort of what we're looking at. We've got two versions of assessments here. We've got sort of the verbal questionnaire, which is very subjective information. And then we've got the gym floor fitness assessments that we put our clients through. How fast can you run a mile? What's your heart rate at the end of this assessment? Uh, how high can you jump, right? All of that is that. So, oh, hey, I'm just gonna hit this little mute button here. Um, Mir, just so you know, I, I put you on mute just real quick, uh, just so I can not get that. Uh, feedback. Um, so that's our, our information. We're going to start by gathering that. Whenever we go through working with a new client, we start by gathering our assessments. Then once we've gathered our information, we're going to generate a problem list. We're going to say, all right, here's the things that we know. Uh, here's the stuff that's preventing us that we're going to start addressing through exercise. This is kind of what we did yesterday, right? We developed a problem list. If I looked at somebody during an overhead squat and I saw that they have a, an excessive low back arch, they have a, an anterior pelvic tilt, I'm going to list that out. Probable overactive muscles, probable underactive muscles, stuff I want to stretch, stuff I want to strengthen, right? That's our, our problem list. Once I've got that, then I'm gonna write a routine. We sat down yesterday after looking at our list, right? We took a little OPT template out and we wrote a workout. I was like, all right, I'm gonna SMR, TFL, I, uh, uh, hip flexors and lats, right? And then I'm gonna do static TFL stretch. I'm literally going to write a plan, right? Um, I'm, gonna int I'm gonna generate a, an integrated program design workout. Okay, so once I've got my problem list, I can work off of that list to write a program for my client. And then I'm gonna continue documenting that slowly over time. In this class, we're teaching you how to use what are called SOAP notes. Now, this is not a NASM approach. This is actually usually something you'll see in like a doctor's office or even dentists use this, um, massage therapists sometimes. You're gonna see this in a lot of like medical-based fields. It's not typically used in gyms, but we wanna cover it in this class because unfortunately we're never gonna get another chance uh, in the program uh, to kind of cover these soap notes. And I do wanna talk about it because some of you guys might not find yourself working in a gym. Maybe you're gonna get really into the whole corrective exercise thing. And you're like, nope, I wanna work in a physical therapy clinic. Great, if that's the case, I wanna teach you guys how to use soap notes because you may run into it sometimes. It's not that common in gyms. Sometimes, I've worked in a gym that used soap notes, but it was also a gym that was more, they had like, we were attached to a physical therapist. So was it a gym? We were kind of the exception that proves the rule in a way. Um, so we're gonna talk about soap notes here in just a second. Um, but this is gonna take us through, soap notes are a way that take us through this five-step process. And by the way, this is that, that uh, one thing that I talk about all the time. This is that three-step problem solving method. Just, it's just pulled apart and made more specific, right? We identify the problem. In POEM, we're, doing, we're identifying the problem um, with these first three steps here. We gather subjective information, which is immeasurable. We gather objective information, which is measurable. And then we generate a problem list, right? That's the first three steps. Then step two, we solve the problem by writing a program to address it. That's our plan. That's our plan of attack, right? That's step two in general problem solving, but it's sort of step four in this version. Uh, and then step three, implement the solution. Do it, right? Um, if I take my car to a mechanic, right? First, he's gonna run diagnostics, you know, hook the little, my car's computer up to the thing. Uh, <laughs> I know nothing about cars, by the way, <laughs> which should be clear from the way I'm talking about cars. 
Uh, but he's going to hook it up to the computer, right? It's going to run a diagnostics. Uh, and then if, you know, there's still dysfunction, he doesn't, you know, he can't really figure out like what's going on because maybe the computer says like, oh, we don't know, right? He's going to get into my car. He's going to poke around, figure things out, right? He's going to measure and look for a problem. Then he's, now he's figured it all out. He's identified the problem, right? So then he's going to give me a call and say like, hey, we found a leak in your rear seal cap, right? And I'll be like, okay, great. Um, and he's like, here's how we can fix that. I just got to go in, take the engine apart, put that, put a new cap on. It's going to cost this many dollars. Do you want to do that? I'm going to say, yeah, absolutely. So now he's gone through step one and step two. He identified the problem. Then he solved the problem by figuring out what was wrong and running his through his brain of information that every know, knows about cars, right? And step three, he's going to be like, cool. I'll call you in a couple hours once I fix it. Implement the solution. Step one, step two, step three. Does that make sense, guys? Yeah. He's feeling good. Mir, Thomas, you guys feeling good on that? Mir, I, I did mute you, by the way, just so you know. You can you can unmute <laughs> to answer. No, yeah, I know. Yeah, I don't know what's going on with my phone. I didn't want to keep building. I don't know if you're hearing like a crazy, like, uh, I'm just, crazy I'm sound. I'm just going to hear echo. my own voice come back at me. Um, it's oh, just bouncing okay. back a little yeah, bit. Yeah. yeah, which is fine. I just want to make sure you know that. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, okay. So that's, that's what we're going to do. So SOAP notes. So... SOAP is an acronym. It stands for Subjective Objective Assessment Plan. Um, again, I want to be really clear here, guys. This isn't anywhere in your textbook. In fact, NASM does not care if you know about SOAP notes. This is a Sochi thing. We thought that it was really important to include this in the curriculum um, because we were having students, you know, I don't know where you guys are going to end up in your career. Some of you guys might want to work with kids. Some of you might want to work with seniors. Some of you might want to work with athletes. Some people... Maybe you don't want to train people. Maybe you end up being like, oof, I want to get into nutrition, uh, which is why we give you the nutritionist certification. Uh, maybe one of you guys want to work in, you know, Thomas, uh, maybe you end up want to work in uh, behavior change, right? Um, we have a behavior change class. It's a coaching class. It's, uh, it's all about using like the psychological principles. I don't know where you're going to end up. But if you end up in physical therapy, not as a physical therapist, if you do that, you got to go get a degree. Uh, you gotta go get a doctorate. Uh, <laughs> but if you end up wanting to work in a physical therapy office as like a PT aid or something like that, you're gonna wanna know a little bit about soap notes um, because this is the tool that they use. This is kind of like their version of an OPT. This is kind of like their version of that workout template I showed you yesterday. Um, so soap notes are a documentation method used for writing a client's program and then documenting their progress over time. And there's four aspects of it. There's the subjective information, uh, which is data that's gathered about your client that cannot be measured. There's also objective information, which is data that's gathered about your client um, that can be measured. So both of these are really great. I don't like subjective more than I like objective. I think they're very similar. Um, it's just the immeasurable stuff. Like, what do you do? What do you like to do? What are your hobbies? Um, you know, what does your dress code look like at work? I know it seems really weird, but here's the thing. If somebody wears high heels, if one person just genetically, for some reason, when they wear high heels, and when I say high heels, I just mean dress shoes. You know, if you look at like even men's dress shoes, you know, just looking up a general picture of this here. Uh, look at that big freaking hard heel. That's a high heel, you know, I'm not saying it's, you know, what, I don't know any, I can't remember what they're called. Uh, what are women's high heels called? Pumps? <laughs> right? Yeah, I'm not saying it's this, but it's still a high heel. It's still an elevated heel. Uh, look at me knowing the name of shoes. Uh, <laughs> my, my girlfriend would be, yeah, I, I listen. Uh, but you can see it's still an elevated heel, right? It's not great. It's, that's putting your calf into a shortened position. I don't know if that's going to affect you, but I know that it could. So I want to know about it in case I can look for it later during a, a, an objective fitness assessment. So then if I measure how much dorsiflexion you can make and I see that it's limited, I can draw the conclusion. It's like, ah, that's probably related to those shoes. You know, so subjective information is general information about their medical history, what uh, medications they might be on. 
you know, one person, person A, they could be on 500 milligrams of so-and-so. Person B could also be on 500 milligrams of so-and-so. But for some reason, physiologically, it doesn't affect person A. But person B, it has a huge effect on them, right? This person never gets lightheaded. This person does. So the medication is considered subjective. I cannot measure how much it's going to affect you. I can't put a number on how affected by your medication you are, even if it is 500 milligrams. Medication is still considered subjective. I can't measure how much 100 milligrams of caffeine is going to affect me versus how it's going to affect Eddie or Thomas or me, right? Like I can't, I can't put a number on how much you know the caffeine will affect you. You know, how much does it affect you? A lot. That's not a number. So that's why it's subjective. Okay. Uh, your occupation, your lifestyle, injuries that you've had, surgeries that you've had, um, medications that you're on, right? Uh, that's all subjective data. I may not be able to put a number on it, but it is still very valuable, right? Because it will help me inform things, right? So Eddie, I know that you got a rotator cuff problem right? That's subjective information that I want to know. Mir, I know that you said you, you, you know, broke your back last year, right? Uh, that is subjective information I want to know, right? Um, it's valuable. Then we've got objective information. So objective information is uh, information that's very number-based. There's a lot more objective assessments that we're going to do than there are subjective ones. Um, but things like, you know, if I want to figure out your target heart rate zones, for instance, that's a really good objective assessment. So as a, uh, one of the assessments we're going to teach you guys how to do is what's called the three-minute step test at the YMCA three-minute step test, right? Uh, that's a really great objective cardio assessment. And basically what it is, is uh, let's say I took all three of you guys and I make all of you step with the pace of a metronome and it's going to go about at that pace. Okay. Um, about, uh, and I make everybody in the room use a 12 inch box. Everybody's on the same size box. You're all going at the same pace and you all go left, right, left, right, up, up, down, down, left, right, left. And I make everybody do it for three straight minutes. All of us. Right. And then all of you guys turn around, sit on the box at the same time, and everybody measures their pulse over the next 60 seconds. Everybody, all at the same time. Right. And let's just say, for the sake of argument, you know, Eddie, your heart rate comes down to, let's say, 95 beats per minute. Mir, yours comes down to about 96 beats per minute. Uh, Thomas, let's say yours comes out to about 98 beats per minute, right? Everybody's all pretty much the same. And then I come in there and I take a seat and my heart rate's about 120 beats per minute. Okay. Um, so then what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at a chart. Uh, and I'm going to look to see what our numbers are, right? Um, for the most part, I'm pretty sure everybody in here is kind of about the same age. Um, so let's say everybody in here is between 26 and 35. I hope I'm not wrong about that. You might, somebody might be younger. Uh, <laughs> but I said, you know, so that puts you, you know, right around 88 to 94, maybe right in here. So that put us in the uh, above average to average category, right? Everybody in here, except for me. My heart rate was 120, right? So mine was down here. I ended up in the poor category. So now that's going to inform what type of cardio program I write for you guys versus what type of cardio program I write for me. You guys, I'm going to put you somewhere between 65 and probably up to maybe 85% of your heart rate. Um, your cardio can be anywhere within there and that's safe. For me though, 65 up to about 75. If I go any higher than that, I'm putting my heart at risk. I might get nauseous. Uh, I might overtrain. I might get an injury, right? Um, I could even damage my heart, heaven forbid, right? So that's not really appropriate. But let's say we put somebody through that assessment, um, you know, and their heart rate was like 53 beats at the end. You know, <laughs> that person's heart is in great freaking shape. So then I'm going to take them up to anywhere from 65% at the low end, all the way up to maybe 95% of their heart rate. 
So that's why cardio assessments are considered very much uh, an objective assessment. That's the YMCA step test. Could be the Rockport walk test. That's another one. Uh, it does the same thing basically. Or maybe the six to 12 minute walk test, same thing. Or even the pacer test. You guys remember in high school, that beep test, right? Beep, and you'd run from one cone to the next. Beep, run from one yeah. cone to the next. Beep, and it would get faster and faster. Um, that's the pacer test. Um, and so it's going to tell me how much uh, heart rate to give you. But here's the other thing. Let's take a look here at the, uh, let's just say for the sake of argument, everybody in here, um, everybody in here has the same resting heart rate. I know we probably don't, but let's say we do, right? So I'm 33 and let's say my resting heart rate is 65 beats per minute. I'm going to hit calculate. So now, remember that I said 65, I qualify for 65 to 75. So for me, that's gonna be somewhere between 144 and 157 beats per minute. That is very number-based information, right? That's why it's considered objective. It's number-based um, versus like, you know, are you on any medications? Okay, great. How much does it affect you? You can't tell me that. We can't put a number on that. So it's subjective, still valuable, right? But not objective. Um, now let's say, Eddie, how old are you? 30. 30. So we said, you know, 144 to 157, but you're 30. So yours mm -hmm. are 146 to 159. That's still 65 to 75%, but the number was slightly different for you. Again, objective, right? Right. Um, so everybody gets a little bit different there. So that's our objective information. We'll, we'll go over that more in detail in later classes and teach you guys how to do those tests. Um, but what about body composition, right? What about like how many inches your chest is or how many inches your waist is or how many inches your biceps are, right? Objective, right? I can track that over time and look for improvements. Um, uh, what about posture assessments? I saw your knees cave in, yes or no? Right. I saw your 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 feet turn out. Right? I saw you excessively lean forward. I saw your forward head posture. Those are all things that I can measure and track and look for improvements over time. They're like, hey, your knees used to come to here. Now they're only coming to here. And then eventually they'll be neutral. Right. Those are objective assessments. And then performance assessments are also really good. Right. This is called the Davies test here. She's got her hands 36 inches apart. We're going to start a 15 second timer. She's going to reach her hand over and touch her other hand. And then she's going to do the same thing on the other side. She's going to go back and forth as fast as possible. Uh, and we're going to measure how many touches she gets in 15 seconds. Or even like uh, uh, the strength assessments, right? How much can you bench press? That's a performance assessment. How fast can you run a mile? How fast can you run a 40 yard dash? Uh, how fast can you run 400 meters, a quarter mile? All of those are examples of performance assessments. So a lot of the assessments we're going to do, here's, uh, this is a balance assessment. This is called the star excursion test. Uh, and you see how it's got these lines. Whoop, um, see how it's got these lines going like this. You basically reach out in each quadrant here um, and measure how far. So if you can reach all the way to the end each time, that's great. But usually it'll be like, you know, maybe to here. And then this one goes further. And then this one may be more narrow. And we measure how far they are. And then we repeat that. And we, uh, we measure it slowly over time. The further outside you can reach, the better. And so we're going to measure improvements in your balance over time. Um, so those are our two major categories of assessments. We're going to teach you guys those in our program design classes. Uh, and then we will also teach them next mod. We'll have an entire mod built around assessments uh, and making that data very, very clear. Um, but once you've got your assessments, well, now, uh, you are going to sort of gather all the relevant assessments and put them in the A section of your SOAP note. So go back to that SOAP note. Now we're putting, you know, client's name, occupation, hobbies, medications, and injuries in the subjective information. We're putting what their, let's say, max bench press was, their max barbell squat, if those are relevant, uh, what their heart rate recovery was in the YMCA step test, uh what their inches are on their waist uh how much they weigh what their bmi is what their blood pressure is all the number based data goes in the objective box 
And then in the assessment box, we're going to uh, gather the stuff that's most relevant towards writing their program. So like list of overactive muscles, list of underactive muscles, that's going to go in the assessment section. Um, what their heart rate is and what their rating of perceived exertion was. Um, we're going to put that in there, right? Um, so their target heart rate zones, right? Uh, we're going to put that over there. Uh, we've also, like I said, we got the RPE scale. Okay, so the RPE scale is the level, of, it's a, it's the rating of perceived exertion scale. It's also sometimes called the Borg scale because that's who it's named after. And basically this is a scale of six to 20 to determine how hard something was. It's a really weird scale. I know six to 20 seems like it makes no sense. Um, but if you think about like someone's resting heart rate when they're asleep, maybe it's around 60 beats per minute. And then usually about 200 is about as high as anybody's ever gonna go. So that's why they pick that number. Obviously there's, you know, not everybody can get up to 200, you know, um, but we use it as a sort of baseline. And so if I asked you to start exercising, I'd say, you know, Eddie, on a scale of, of six to 20, I want this to be somewhere around like a 12. That means you're in your warm up. you know, it's really gentle. But then if I said, all right, Mir, I want you to be somewhere around like a 15, that's where it starts to get like hard. That's like the middle of your workout where you're starting to breathe a little bit. Like maybe you do like, you know, kind of like yesterday's workout actually, right? Um, that was probably somewhere between, I'd say like a 14, eh, yeah, maybe like a 13 or a 14 yesterday. You know, it yeah, wasn't- Yeah, what was that one that we were, uh, the one where we were doing the squat and then we were laterally raising the dumbbells? What was that yeah, called? Yeah, the lunge with the lateral raise. By the way, yeah. morning and evening workouts ended up a little bit different, just Thomas and Eddie. Just, okay. You know. But yeah, okay. you know, okay. the lunge with the like lateral if I was, uh, if I was to do that, and probably like 20 of them yeah bro that would be like that'd be like yeah, 15 right 16 by the end right of it there. you'd be like yeah. Ah. <laughs> you know, yeah yeah you'd be breathing like crazy right yeah yeah mm -hmm. so i wanted it somewhere between like 13 maybe to 15 you know um i know eddie by the end of you pick we had some heavy dumbbells in your hands uh at one point yeah we had 25 on the press uh, yeah. what, what was, was sweat, the... right? yeah well, uh, well was, i mean i sweat easily <laughs> yeah yeah so maybe that was a little bit closer. Maybe it was a six. I don't know. But it's going to be a little bit different. For it her. felt like a 13, honestly. Really? Oh, okay. Like Great. Great. It's just, uh, like I said, I, I sweat easily. I'm sitting down sweating already, like doing nothing. Fair, fair. <laughs> but yeah. let's say, let's say, you know, let's say like Thomas, you think about like, uh, remember when we were doing, uh, we were out on the field, we were doing all that SAQ stuff, the speed ladder into this, into that, into this, um, you know. Mm -hmm uh hopefully we got a couple times a little out of breath we were like whoo you know we were hoping for recovery <laughs> like i would love some rest that is somebody who's maybe landing at like a 17 or 18 uh and then there is like maximal exertion which is like i'm about to throw up you know <laughs> like i'm about yeah. to pass out right that's like a 19 20. um so here's the thing, that's our RPE, right? Now, normally we'll probably use like a modified Borg scale. We'll probably go one to 10 because it's a lot easier for people to measure. Um, but think of it as like exercise starts around like a five or a six. It's in the middle around like a seven or eight. And then like sprinting is like a nine, maybe a 10. But honestly, like you really shouldn't be getting to 10 that often. If you're getting to 10, you need like three or four minutes of rest, you know? Like today, I'm going to go down, like today I'm going to be doing... Uh, uh, like some really max effort, like squats. I'm hoping to, hoping to retest on my one rep max today. Um, that should be a 10, you know, cause it's a one rep, but if I'm doing like five reps, that's probably closer to like an eight or a nine. If I'm doing like six to, to 12 reps, that's probably like a six or seven, especially if it's like a 12, then probably closer to like a six. Uh, and then like, if I'm doing like up to 20 repetitions, that's somewhere between like a four or a five on the RPE scale. Um, doesn't mean that I can't be out of breath, by the way. I'm, I'm just measuring strength scale there. If I talked about cardio, 20 reps, I'm going to be like, <sighs> maybe that's closer to a, you know, that starts to get closer cardio wise up to an eight or a nine, you know? So the RPE is just the rating of perceived exertion. What you think is hard is going to be different than what I think is hard versus, you know, LeBron. <laughs> like, uh, it's their, it's your perception of exertion. 
So that's, we can write down all of our relevant information, right? Now, obviously medications are gonna affect this. Medications can have a really intense effect on your blood, uh, which is why an RPE scale can actually be more effective for clients who are on medications. That's something to always keep an eye on. You know, if you're looking at somebody's heart rate monitor and it's like, oh, you're not even working that hard. Meanwhile, they're over there like, <laughs> right? <laughs> it's like they're on a medication that lowers, artificially lowers their heart rate. Don't hit that plus button anymore. You know, <laughs> like <laughs> if you're looking at just like, oh, this is only 65% of your heart rate, right? That's where an RPE scale becomes really important. Um, you know, sometimes medications will have no effect or sometimes it'll have, sometimes like uh, we call it a paradoxical effect. Sometimes it'll do the opposite it'll actually artificially raise their heart rate. Um, so you do wanna be somewhat familiar with medications, guys, um, just a little bit in case you have a client who ever tells you they're on them. Beta blockers, uh, and here's a list of what happens. So beta blockers usually lower the heart rate and they usually lower the blood pressure. So if your client's on a beta blocker and you're like, oh man, your heart rate's not even going up and then you're just cranking up the speed. <laughs> your client's going to be really upset because <laughs> um, it'll be like, you know, you're only paying. Again, this is why we don't do diagnosis oriented exercise management, right? Um, uh, if they're on a calcium channel blocker, this can actually have all kinds of effects on their heart rate, or it'll usually just lower their blood pressure. Nitrates usually don't affect blood pressure, uh, but they sometimes can raise the heart rate. Um, sometimes they'll lower it, but usually it doesn't have much of an effect. Uh, diuretics, not much when it comes to heart rate, but they can lower the blood pressure. Um, bronchodilators, vasodilators. By the way, vasodilators, um, fun fact, they were, uh, uh, you know, they were, they're, they're something that opens blood vessels, right? Which is great for clients who have hypertension problems. Um, but this is just a random fun fact for the day. That is also how we discovered Viagra, <laughs> which is a <laughs> vasodilator. <laughs> it opens the blood vessels up to a very specific area. <laughs> um, but that's what that was. So that's how we discovered that. Um, and then antidepressants actually uh, can sometimes raise heart rate uh, or sometimes lower blood pressure. So, you know, um, that's something to be aware of. So we just want to keep an eye on that. Um, but generally guys, when it comes to measuring intensity as a general rule of thumb, uh, you're going to have your heart rate zones. So you're going to try to keep your client within those zones once you've measured them and labeled them out. Uh, or you're going to use the Borg scale. You're going to say, hey, I want this to be like a seven or an eight or a nine, you know, uh, in terms of like maximal intensity. Or maybe we want it as low as a six. If I want my client to go for a walk, for instance, right? I'm trying to like get them to rehab after a heart attack or something. I don't want them at a nine, you know, that's totally dangerous. Instead, I might say, hey, on a scale of like one to 10, with one being you are asleep and 10 being you are sprinting as hard as you can, I want you to go for a walk today and I want it to be somewhere around like a five, maybe a six, right? So that's, the, that's how we use the RP. That's the modified Borg scale. If I, if I was on a regular Borg scale, I'd say like a 12 to 13, that's six to 20. Six being asleep, 20 being sprinting. I want you somewhere around like a, 12, maybe a 13. Um, so that's the Borg scale. And it's going to be a really, you know, we're going to bring this up all the time. This is going to be a very common method that we use for, for exercise. Um, we can also use the talk test, by the way, which we didn't mention today. Um, if you're doing cardio and we break it into three zones, you have the endurance zone. I want you to be breathing hard, but you should be able to hold a conversation pretty comfortably. Then I've got like the cardio zone which is like, I want you to be a little bit out of breath. Speaking should be pretty uncomfortable. And then we got the zone three, which is like the peak zone. That's where it's like, you shouldn't be able to talk, <laughs> right? Yeah. That's, that's the talk test. So if I tell my client, yeah, if I'm holding a conversation with my client and they're speaking comfortably, I know they're in zone one. If they're having trouble speaking, I know they're in zone two. And if they're like, <sighs> hold on, what's Ah, you know, like, that's, okay. <laughs> that's me at ultimate, right? I'll like sometimes make a play and I'm like, ah, and they're like, good job. And I'm like, thank you. <laughs> yeah, it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> that's zone three. That's me covering this guy, Marcus. Ugh, oh. <laughs> as an animal. 
<laughs> so, um, so that's how we can use SOAP notes. Um, we write our program, we write our plan into here. Uh, a lot of times, honestly, when I am using SOAP notes, my plan will be something like, you know, three to five days of exercise per week, 30 to 60 minutes, C O P T template. And that will be, you know, flip the page and there's my workout program. Um, so we will be using examples of SOAP notes in this class. Um, you're probably, like I said, you're probably not going to see them in most actual gyms. That's okay. Um, but we're going to use a couple examples every day, uh, starting, uh, Monday. Um, we won't see a soap note tomorrow, I don't think. Um, but I will give you example soap notes uh, for the as we look at things. And it's just a different approach to writing programs. You know, um, not that you guys need to be experts on it. It's not even in your book. Um, but I think you'll see it's kind of a fun, different approach. So Thomas, this will be very unique uh, compared to all of our other program design classes. Um, it'll be kind of a unique take on things. And that'll be fun. Looking forward to it. Yeah. All right, we did it. I made this lecture last long enough. Uh, <laughs> um, all right, guys. Uh, any questions today? Um, no, good. Love that. All right, fellas. Uh, you made it through day one of your second class. That's exciting. Uh, uh, we survived Kinesis, and uh, yeah. I'll see you tomorrow for another gentle one. For sure. All right, now. Sounds good. All right, guys. All right, guys. Have a good one. See ya. Likewise.